Florida state lawmakers have called it a band-aid to hold together a prison system on the brink of collapse. And now it's a more than $31 million plan in motion. The National Guard activated to provide relief at understaffed prisons. More than a year after launching our series Crisis in Corrections, our I-Team investigator Kylie McGivern reveals what the National Guard activation means for the country's third largest prison system and the public that system is meant to protect. I think most people don't understand how desperate the situation is inside the Florida prison system. Republican State Senator Jeff Brandis of St. Pete has been at the forefront of a push for prison reform in Florida, sounding the alarm on the crisis in corrections. When you have understaffed facilities, what it ultimately means is you have more corrections officer abuse, you have more inmate on inmate violence, you have more drugs in the facility, and you have more overall contraband. Brandis told the I-Team the need for the National Guard to alleviate excessive officer overtime and give corrections more time to hire and train new staff shows the state legislature hasn't done its job. Well, I think it's embarrassing, frankly, the fact that we're having to call the National Guard in because the legislature hasn't put enough resources towards this problem to actually fix it. With staffing levels as desperately short as they are, Florida was bumping up against an emergency release number that would have forced them to begin to release inmates. In the last legislative session, FDC received record pay increases to retain and recruit corrections officers, leading to a net gain of nearly 640 officers, a move in the right direction for the first time in years, the department says. Still, it's not enough. As of September, the vacancy rate still set at about 24%, more than 4,000 employees short. That vacancy rate has since dropped some to 21%. Reviewing FDC records, the I-Team discovered a new trend. More and more of the people leaving are those in higher ranks with more experience. What has happened over the last few years, the Department of Corrections has become the training school for other agencies. Officers of all ranks have received offers or job opportunities for other agencies. James Biardi, president of the Florida Police Benevolent Association's Corrections Chapter, says there is still a lot of work to be done to retain people. You have less experienced staff, you have a shortage of staff. That means that you're working more hours in a dangerous environment. These are all formulas for disaster. And the reality is a year after some of these paying increases and bonuses were put in, we are now calling in the National Guard. What does that say? The task is at hand. It was 10 years of prior administrations overlooking, not concerned about it, that have built up so bad. And I think the greatest fixer of all cannot fix um, a problem in one day. Biardi says even though relief from the National Guard is temporary, it's necessary. They need help immediately. The staffing level at the prisons now are in crisis and it's an emergency and I'm glad that the governor called out the National Guard. As far as action in other state prison systems, we found National Guard members activated in Ohio, New Hampshire, Indiana and Idaho for staffing shortages, but those were strictly due to COVID-19 and the pandemic. Here, the National Guard will not be in direct contact positions with inmates. Think perimeter posts, entry and exit security, for example. After training at Camp Blanding, 300 members of the National Guard are now assisting at nine prisons in the Panhandle for nine months, a timeline many lawmakers doubt. I can't imagine it would be limited to just nine months. Biardi says the union is working to get additional pay raises next year to retain experienced officers. We still have a long way to go. Like other issues within the Department of Corrections, activation of the National Guard is something Secretary Ricky Dixon has not discussed with us. I first emailed Corrections about an interview with Dixon nearly a year ago, weeks after his appointment. Since then, I've sent more than 17 emails and made numerous phone calls reminding them of that request. After repeated assurances, they were working to set up a time. I was recently told we are not moving forward with scheduling an interview. When asked what changed, the department did not answer that question. FDC says it wants to be transparent, so our request for a sit-down interview with Secretary Dixon remains open. With photojournalist Matt McGlashan, I'm IT team investigator Kylie McGivern taking action for you.